left you. Why the long face? What's wrong? I don't know, there's something wrong. What? There's something wrong with the taters. What do you mean there's something wrong? Don't be a fool, man. For God's sake, I mean, look, they're trying to laugh and they're rushing. Smell them. What did you do to them? You did something stupid, didn't you? What's wrong? Why are you fighting? Never mind, we call you in a minute. I've heard this happening around the place. It's called blight. Tater blight. We'd better check the field and hope this won't feed us. Pat, Maggie, bring your sister and come with me. Uh, the famine was simply caused by a disease uh, called the blight uh, that hit the potato crop uh, not only in Ireland uh, but in other areas as well in uh, Europe and also of course uh, in England but it was very severe in Ireland because uh, the population in the main depended, there were so many people in Ireland uh, who depended on the potato for their normal sustenance every day. young lad, uh, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, they would eat um, uh, that amount of potatoes in a day. You'd hardly eat that amount in a week, I'd say, would you? No. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Uh, and then the mammy of the family, she would eat two packs of those. About 11 pounds of, of potatoes would, would equal two packs of those. And then the father of the family, because he'd be out working in the fields and that, he would eat three of those per day. What parts of the country were affected most? Well, uh, initially uh, the, the blight, um, it was first discovered uh, in the summer of 1845 in the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. And then uh, very soon it uh, was seen on the mainland. And when the potato failed through blight, They had nothing else. What else could you eat? Grass. And sadly, some of them did eat grass. Well, the Prime Minister at the time, in 1845, uh, was a man by the name of um, Sir Robert Peel. And to be fair to him, he tried to do something. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, although some of you seem to be denying the onset of a famine in Ireland, Her Majesty's Government is helping out at the moment. At this point in time, there is a ship due to dock in Ireland with a cargo of Indian meal from the Americas. Very lawful indeed, Sir Robert, but who may ask us to pay this very generous gesture? We cannot in all conscience stand idly by and do nothing. A great many people will surely die if we do nothing. Laissez faire, Sir Robert, laissez faire. The government should not interfere in these matters under any circumstances. You have exceeded your authority. We as a sovereign country have a moral obligation. He, in the early days of 1846, he uh, initiated public works. Come on, everyone. Come over. The work we are going to do here today is to build a wall just here. Women and children will carry the smaller stones, men the larger. What pay are we going to get for this work? Women and children will get four pence a day, men 13 pence a day. That if you put in a full day's work, nothing less will do. We work just as hard as the men, we should get the same. You ungrateful little wretch! You're lucky to be getting what you're getting. And I'm thinking I might have no work for you here today. Ma, ma, we need the money to pay for food, please, ma. Well, make up your mind, there's plenty more that'll do the work. You men over there at the wall, start gathering stones and all the rest of you. And be quick about it. This won't pay for food at all. The price for food's after getting um, way too high altogether. Most of the people here are already starving. Some won't last a day and it's freezing as well.
I had watched the progress of the foreign policy of the government. I could see nothing in it but machinery, deliberately devised and skillfully worked, for the entire subjugation of the island, the slaughter of the portion of the people and the pauperisation of the rest. And I therefore come to the conclusion that the whole system ought to be met with resistance at every point. And the means for this would be extremely simple, namely a combination among the people to obstruct and render impossible the transport and shipment of Irish provisions, to refuse all aid to its removal, to destroy the highways, to prevent everyone by intimidation from daring to bid for grain and cattle if brought to auction under distress in short, to offer a passive resistance universally but occasionally when opportunity served to try to steal. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. I have shown you our stress. I have shown you that there are no agricultural labourers, no peasantry in Europe so badly off, suffering such privations as do the great body of the Irish people. There are five millions of people always on the verge of starvation. I have shown you from the government documents that its Irish people are threatened that they are in utmost danger of fearful famine with its concomitant horrors. I call upon all the members of the House to join this in the most energetic measures to stop the impending committee. You cannot be too speedy. You cannot be too extensive in your remedies. Death to an enormous amount will be the consequences of neglect. Charles Trevelyan was secretary to the Treasury, which basically meant he had control of money spent by the British government, and this role made him a virtual dictator when it came to helping Ireland. He believed that the famine was the will of God and that it should run its own course without any help from the government. He also, along with some members of the government, believed that the famine was a good way of controlling the rapid population growth of Ireland at the time. Little wonder that he became the most hated man in Ireland. What say you now, Trevelyan? Relief efforts should be stopped now or you run the risk of paralysing all private enterprise and having this country on you for an indefinite number of years. Remember, it is God's will that this country has gone in this direction. It was also well known that there was enough food in the country at the time of the famine to feed most of the people, but this was being exported for profit by most of the landlords and some farmers. Money was collected all over the world to help alleviate the hardship on the Irish people. The Jamestown, a United States warship, was converted to carry supplies of food to Ireland. This was just one of the many ships sent from the United States with cargoes of food. One of the most generous gestures was that of the Choctaw Indian tribe of Oklahoma who even though they had little for themselves donated $710 to the relief funds. Sixteen years prior to this gesture, the Choctaw Nation suffered greatly when they were removed from their own land by President Andrew Jackson, himself the son of an Irish immigrant. 21,000 Choctaws were forced to march 500 miles to their new reservation over half of them died on this journey from exposure, malnutrition and disease. This journey became known as the Trail of Tears. This hovel, if we can call it that, belongs to the Mullins family. You were here a couple of days ago, weren't you, Doctor? Yes, I was. Terrible, terrible. There was nothing I could do for poor Miss Mullins. The fever had too strong a grip. We had to bury her in her own garden. I fear for the father and children. Is it safe to go in there? No, it's not. No place is safe now. But if you want to do a drawing, put a scarf over your nose and mouth. It might give you some protection. Is me man with you? She's been gone for food for a long time. Come on, Mary. You have to go. 
have to eat, please. Where you go? Come on, Mary, please. She's not moving. Come on, Mary, please. What happened in the Mullins household was happening throughout the whole of Ireland. Dr. Treel and his family travelled the roads of West Cork, helping out families whenever they could. Sometime after this episode with the Mullins family, Dr. Treel sadly died from fever he contracted while helping people in the area. Dr. Donovan spent many years tending to famine patients during and after the famine earning a reputation as a kind and caring doctor. Evictions became commonplace throughout Ireland. People were forced to live and die in the most appalling of conditions, at the side of roads by their landlords or middlemen. But it must be said that not all landlords acted like this. Some landlords did all they could to help their tenants. Some died helping them and a number of them went bankrupt trying to do so. I'm hungry ma'am, can I have something to eat please? Hush child, hang on for another while, there's not much food left. Where are we going anyway? Have we far to go? I'm hungry as well. Look, we'll rest up here for a while and move on when we're resting. Because Catholics were suffering worst of all, the Catholic clergy found themselves going to great pains trying to minimise that suffering. Many of them fell victim to diseases that became a natural outcome of starvation. By 1847, the Diocese of Cork and Ross alone, 17 priests died having contracted fever upon attending their flock. Many Protestant clergy also suffered badly during those days. While a small number of them indulged in proselytism, offering food to Catholics if they converted over to Protestantism. Some did so in order to feed their families. Many of them returned to Catholicism when the famine was over. Wake up, Ma. Come on, wake up. What's wrong? It's all noise. Ma won't wake up. Come on, Ma. Looks strange. She's dead. Her body's cold. Won't she wake up at all? I'm afraid not, child. She's in heaven. All we can do is pray. can't just leave her here like this. So what do you want me to do? We can't do the grave. Look, you or Michael cover her up. I'll bring the young ones away. <laughs> 